as God is glorified by the prayer of the anthem, may God also be glorified by our proclamation. Let us pray. Gracious God, we once again seek to have your self-disclosure, your self-revelation, speaking to us this day beyond the sacred page. Speak to us by the power of your spirit. Speak to us that we may have within us, by your word, the same heart and mind that was in Jesus Christ. Empowered by the same heart and mind of Christ, by your spirit, send us forth into the world that we may actually take on the incarnation of your word and be the hands and feet that would make your love known. Help us to not only hear your word, but to allow it to be engrafted into our souls, that it may take root in us and that it may be of produce for the world. Plant your word within us. Speak to us this day of your love and grace. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lecture for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 56. Actually, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the official lectionary uh, reading for today is uh, from 51 to 62, but I'm only taking the first half of it because there is uh, plenty of sermon material in just the first half of the text. Uh, and I, I could go longer, if you'd like, by preaching the rest of it, but... Uh, but I want to uh, just focus on, on these particular verses, <coughs> verses 51 through 56. Why is this, this particular passage significant, my Christian friends? This is, uh, in Luke's gospel, the way Luke lays out his gospel, the, the actual structure of it, is that when you reach this point in chapter 9, Jesus had just, just uh, finished his, uh, his uh, commissioning of his disciples, telling them what to do when they go on missionary journeys. He has <coughs> just... Uh, 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 revealed his glory in the transfiguration. And now, Jesus sets his face on Jerusalem. Everything that will happen from this point forward in Luke's gospel is Jesus' ministry while on a journey to Jerusalem. Up until this point, all of his ministry has been taking place up in the northern region of the Roman province of Palestine, Palestina, uh, and it, uh, uh, primarily in the region of Galilee, but now he is setting his course for his face set for Jerusalem, which will be the end game, which is exactly what he's been aiming for with regard to the mission and message of God's kingdom. <coughs> to do so, to begin that journey to Jerusalem, he must pass through Samaria, which is an area peopled by, for lack of a better term, uh, Jewish heretics at least from the Jewish perspective. Samaritans and Jews do not get along. Um, the, and it's made even worse by the situation we're about to see here this day. Jesus is about to be rejected by the Samaritans, but that's just the beginning of the rejection that Jesus will face as he is setting his face to Jerusalem. <coughs> Listen for the word of God. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for his arrival. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Whoa, uh, I have to say, whenever every time I read this, uh, this passage, I'm thinking, these disciples are pretty cocky. <laughs> uh, they really are. But in truth, to their, to their, uh, to their defense, 
They're being biblical, and I'll show you why in just a moment. But we first want to start out in looking at this particular uh, paragraph by looking at verse 51 and what the narrator, Luke, is telling you and me, the reader. Something that is not uh, immediately known by James or John or any of the other characters in chapter 9. But Luke is telling you and me something, at least three different things that we need to have in mind before we can proceed in the story. What does verse 51 tell us? First, Jesus knows that his ministry is moving swiftly to its close. Things are wrapping up. The purpose for which Jesus came into the world is about to be fulfilled very shortly. That's the first thing we see. The second thing that Luke is telling us is that Jesus is to be, and this is the phrase, taken up. Taken up. A very interesting expression. It implies that the, the whole drama of the kingdom of God, the whole drama of God's love for this world is about to come to fruition. This taken up is uh, an implication. It expresses the implication of the whole drama of crucifixion, of resurrection, and ascension. That Jesus is being taken up from the ground onto the cross in the crucifixion. That Jesus is being taken up from death into life in the resurrection. That Jesus is being taken up from Jerusalem into heaven in the ascension. We won't see that third one until you get to Luke's uh, second volume, the book of Acts, uh, where the ascension takes place. But uh, suffice it to say that this is what Luke is trying to tell the readers, that Jesus is to be taken up, that the, the grand drama of the kingdom of God is about to be fulfilled in the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension, all implied in that phrase, taken up. And I will say that finally, this third thing that I think uh, Luke wants us as the readers to know is that Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem. What does that mean? To set his face, as Luke says, it echoes the song of the suffering servant in uh, the prophet Isaiah. And Luke knows this. That's why he's using this phrase, because he sees Jesus as the suffering servant spoken of in the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, where it, it says, uh, you hear in the, the song of the suffering servant, this phrase, Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. That statement alone should tell us, as the readers, to anticipate strong opposition. Jesus is about to face opposition as he is about to fulfill his mission in Jerusalem. He has so, so much so is he going to have to set his face like a flint, like an unmovable stone, in order to accomplish this. Because he's going to be receiving opposition, rejection, all the way. The kingdom of God is not without its detractors. Jesus knows it. And Luke knows it. That's why he's telling you and me in verse 51. Be prepared in what we're about to read. The journey to Jerusalem begins with rejection. It begins with rejection. Just as Jesus' baptism was followed by rejection uh, in Nazareth, so also Jesus' uh, 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 transfiguration, which just happens, uh, is followed by rejection by the Samaritans. In fact, it, it's, we can see those as parallels. Uh, at Jesus' baptism, the voice of God comes from heaven, declaring Jesus to be the Son of God. And what's the first action that the people show Jesus upon that revelation? Jesus goes to Nazareth, where he is rejected. Likewise, at the transfiguration, the voice of God booms from heaven, declaring Jesus to be the Son of God. And the first place he goes, what happens? He's rejected. He goes to Samaria. He's rejected by the Samaritans. Rejection by the Samaritans is a testimony, if you will, uh, to two things. It certainly tells us that there's tensions between Jews and, and Samaritans. That's, uh, that should go without, uh, 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 without our uh, uh, 
mistaken notice that somehow or other we know that's the case. Uh, the, the Samaritans and the Jews just don't get along. We know that historically. But it should also come to us the idea that they are just unwilling. Even if, even if this man were a Samaritan, they're unwilling to follow him or to show him hospitality or to welcome him into their town because his, eye, his, his face is set toward Jerusalem. The Samaritans consider the Jews to be um, uh, uh, just uh, a highbrow, uh, nose in the air kind of people who uh, who think that they are better than the Samaritans, and the, uh, and uh, that's what the Samaritans think of the Jews. And the Jews pretty much think that the uh, the Samaritans are are heretics. There's really not much room for them to be talking to each other. So the Samaritans are going to reject Jesus on many fronts. He has his ministry to Jews and Gentiles alike so far, to social, to ritual and political outcasts so far. Jesus has been doing this. He now wants to carry his ministry to, to Jewish heretics, these Samaritans. And at every step of the way, Jesus is being rejected. All he wants to do is bring a message of love and compassion and grace he wants to witness to the very embodiment of the kingdom of God in this world, and he gets rejected. We should have seen that coming, by the way, my Christian friends, in the passage we read last Sunday, chapter 8. In Garaza, Jesus heals the Gerizim demoniac. What a wonderful testimony to the love and compassion of God and the kingdom. But what happens? The people tell Jesus to get out of town. What should be good news is met with rejection. You've seen it all the way through. Whether it's, whether it's Jews or Gentiles, whether they're social outcasts, ritual outcasts, political outcasts, nobody wants to receive Jesus' message. You know, as I'm thinking about it, my Christian friends, we look at those disciples, James and John, sons of Zebedee, um, their brothers, uh, one can almost appreciate the anger that James and John feel at the rejection Jesus has shown when he requests simple hospitality from the Samaritans. I understand their anger. I, I do. I understand it. Jesus has refused hospitality. James and John love Jesus so much. They are offended that these Samaritans would reject him. That they wouldn't show him hospitality. They are, they're being protective of Jesus. They're being protective of their Messiah, their teacher. And they don't know how to handle rejection, James and John. They don't know how to handle rejection. They bring to mind the overzealous um, experiences they, they read about in 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And I know, I know every one of you knows that story, right? Every, I just, all I had to do is just say those verses and you know it. It's a passage about the prophet Elijah sitting on a, on a, on a hilltop. And uh, uh, a Samaritan ruler uh, sends the captain of the guard along with 50 men to, to summon uh, Elijah. But Elijah will have none of it. And so Elijah, in the story, sect uh, uh, Second Kings summons fire to come down from heaven and consume the captain and the 50, uh, 50 men with him. Now, I'm not, I'm not promoting that as a good thing. I'm simply telling you that's what's in the minds of the disciples. They, they know their scriptures. They know their Old Testament. And so they're thinking, hey, the Samaritans here are once again rejecting the hospitality why don't we, Jesus, summon fire to come down from heaven and consume them in your mercy? <laughs> uh, why don't we do this? As the, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, where do these disciples, first of all, think they can do this? And why would their minds go to something like that? I mean, it's almost comical. You can see Jesus there basically standing back and saying, No, boys, no, I got this. Uh, I'll take care of it. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. They remember well, these disciples, their Old Testament passage of bringing a curse down on the people. But for some reason, they have very, very great difficulty remembering what Jesus just told them a few verses earlier in this very chapter, in Luke chapter 9. 
In, the, in, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, Jesus tells them when you go out to speak to people, accept their hospitality if offered. If they offer you no hospitality, shake the dust from your shoes and move on. Go to the next village. That's what Jesus said to them. He didn't say anything about bringing hellfire down upon the people who don't receive them. He simply says, if they don't show hospitality, move on. Move on. They don't remember that. They don't remember what Jesus said, at least not long. But they certainly remember what they read in 2 Kings. Jesus rebukes James and John for an attitude of vengeance and retaliation, an attitude totally foreign to Jesus' ministry, an attitude totally foreign to their ministry, an attitude totally foreign to our own ministry as Christians. You know, it's interesting that uh, when you read Scripture, you note that Jesus gives James and John the nicknames Th Sons of Thunder. I have to think that maybe this was the occasion for which they gave them that name, that Jesus gave them the name Sons of Thunder, because they, they dare bring fire down upon their enemies in the name of the kingdom of God. The mission moves on to Jerusalem. My Christian friends, this episode calls us to ponder our temptation to use violence to achieve our ends, even when our ends are right and noble and good. We Christians know perfectly well what the love of God looks like. We've experienced it in the course of our lives. We go out into the world to make that love known, and we are expecting people to say, Oh, Jesus loves me? Okay. Okay. But in fact, we don't get that kind of reception when we try to make the love, of God's, uh, the love of God known to the world. And so there is a certain side of us that feels rejected, and we, like James and John, don't always know what to do with rejection. We're ready to bring fire down upon people. Does insult entitle us to do injury? Does being right or having a holy cause justify us using force to accomplish what is otherwise a good purpose? Maybe we need to use a little violence in order to, uh, because, the, because the ends will justify the means, right? Let's, let's do something uh, rough and, and rugged in order to, to bring about peace and goodwill. You know, Elijah called down fire. Couldn't Jesus' disciples do the same? That's what they're thinking. Misunderstanding the identity of, of Jesus, the disciples mistakenly thought they could achieve their ends by violence. How often have those who claim to follow Jesus Christ repeated that mistake like the early disciples? We are quick to curse. We can remember how to do that, but we don't often remember Jesus' words about, uh, about raining love and compassion upon those who don't show us the same. You know, it's so easy that we can... Uh, we, we remember the, the passages, like the disciples, we remember the passages of vengeance. But it seems as though those passages of mercy and grace we sort of remember only long enough to get out of the door, the door of the church when we go out into the world. You know, it, this should not come as a mistake. And, uh, and uh, This is a theological statement. It is not a political one, but it needs to be said. When we look at what was happening in the world um, a few years ago, when we saw uh, people using violence on, on our national capital, Flying flags that say Jesus saves, there is something not right about that picture, my Christian friends. To call for the assassination of persons, does it matter which political party? They were calling for the assassination of people from both parties. 
and yet flying the flags that Jesus saves in the process. How does the kingdom of God come to look like that? We're guilty, my Christian friends. We sometimes use force to accomplish what we want simply because we tell ourselves it's a good cause, it's a worthy cause. Jesus will have none of it. Jesus will have none of it. So much so that Jesus has his face set on Jerusalem, knowing perfectly well that that course means rejection. That's exactly what the disciples must endure. We are convinced that the love of God prevails. And we get upset when we don't see it happening the way we think it should. If people won't turn to Christianity, maybe we should force them to do it. That's the disciples thinking. Jesus calls them out for it. He calls us out for it, too. I'm not saying that you and I are about ready to, uh, to go out and, and create an, uh, an act of violence. But how quickly do we forget that our mission requires us to be compassionate, even sacrificial, in making Christ's love known? The disciples had yet to learn that violence begets violence. And that Jesus had to come to break the cycle of violence by dying. He comes to break the cycle of violence by forgiving rather than by killing and exacting vengeance. It's a hard lesson, my Christian friends, because when we are met with violence, when we are met with rejection, we want to reject as well. That is not the way of the kingdom of God. And it's perhaps one of the hardest things we have to learn as Christians. We are taught all too often that coming into the church means that uh, we commit our lives to Jesus Christ and suddenly things are going to be easy and simple for us. No, in fact, committing ourselves to Jesus Christ means the road to Jerusalem is always going to be fraught with rejection and sometimes suffering. Tough sell, my Christian friends, but that's what the love of the kingdom of God looks like. And I call you, I call myself, to be less, uh, less prone to focus on the, uh, the vengeance parts of the Bible and focus on the merciful parts of the Bible. Yes, it's true. Vengeance is in the Bible. Mercy is in the Bible. But only one of those is Christ-like. And it's important to know the difference. Amen and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.